Dear aspirants, welcome to Daily Current Affairs brought to you by Neo IAS. Today is 5th October 2018 and we will we'll have a list of topics which we can discuss one by one. So let us start. Really a very sad news to begin with. Okay. It reads like 21 lions died in Gir Sanctuary last month and the deaths are attributed to a virus called canine distemper virus. Okay. So we will take this as an opportunity to learn more about Asiatic lions, its conservation in India, various controversies associated with its conservation and uh, gear forest and uh, the villain. Villain is uh, the canine distemper virus. Asiatic lions, Asiatic lions are also known as Persian lions or Indian lions. As the name suggests, these animals were found in good numbers and found very common in West Asia, Eastern Turkey, Central India and until until 19th century these were very common in the aforementioned areas okay but 20th century marked the decline of this fascinating big cat and now it is restricted to gear forest okay so it is restricted to a single location hence it is listed as endangered in the IUCN red list so moving on the villain canine distemper virus it's a viral i mean viral disease it is highly contagious via inhalation and it affects almost all variety of animals okay be it domestic or wild and uh, if you search in google canine distemper virus it will yield images of cats and uh, dogs with uh, this uh, nasal discharge so that is one of the symptoms of this uh, common symptoms of this canine distemper virus infected virus infected animal so the common system common symptoms include high fever high eye inflammation eye and nose discharge labored breathing and coughing in 1994 uh, this canine distemper virus became notorious for uh, an epidemic in serengeti region of africa where thousand lions died in 3 weeks where thousand lions died in 3 weeks okay one more important point related to asiatic lion is that it is one of the five pantherine cats inhabiting in India okay the other four pantherine cats in India are uh, snow leopard Indian leopard clouded leopard and royal tigers royal Bengal tigers okay so these are the five pantherine cats inhabiting India so moving on to Asiatic land conservation here you will come across a very important project called Asian lion reintroduction project okay so under this Asian lion reintroduction project actually when the number of Asiatic lions were or the Asiatic lions were restricted only to Gir National Park an attempt was made to introduce this Asiatic lions to Chandra Prabha Wildlife Sanctuary in Uttar Pradesh in 1957 but the population disappeared after 1965 okay later under this Asiatic lion reintroduction project which suggested or which considered, which identified Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh as the most promising translocation site. Here starts the ego of Gujarat state government. What happened was Gujarat state officials resisted the relocation. Can you imagine why did they resist? Because they believe that it would make Gir Sanctuary lost its status as the world's only home of Asiatic land. But Supreme Court intervened in 2013. Supreme Court ordered Gujarat state to send some of their gear lines to Madhya Pradesh to establish a second population there. But as of now, the plan to shift lines to Kuno is in jeopardy. And Madhya Pradesh seem to have lost their interest and the project is in a standstill. The Asiatic Land Reintroduction Project is an initiative of the Indian government to provide safeguards to the Asiatic land from extinction. So by now you know the relevance of Gir Forest. So this is all about, these are some factual information about Gir Forest. Gir Forest is also known as Sasan Gir and it is a forest and wildlife sanctuary near Talala Gir in Gujarat. It is one of the most protected regions of Asia due to its only surviving wild Asiatic land population. Gir Forest was part of Nawab of Junagar's private hunting grounds. Okay, this is an, a, a historical connection with Gir Forest. It was a private hunting ground of Nawab of Junagar. 
Okay, there is a tribe associated with gir forest. Please uh, remember the name. Uh, this is a factual information. Maldaris tribe. Okay, Maldaris tribe is a tribe associated with gir forest. Moving on, our next topic is Operation Samudra Maitri. We know that Indonesia is in news for the past one week. Yesterday also we have discussed a news from Indonesia. Indonesia is already hit by a worst tsunami. And yesterday we have discussed about a about an active volcanic eruption in Indonesia. Okay. So Operation Samudra Maitri is nothing but India's humanitarian assistance to tsunami hit Indonesia. So two Indian Air Force aircrafts C-130J and C-17 were departed with medical personnel and relief material to Indonesia already and also three Indian Navy ships were also engaged in this disaster management and humanitarian assistance program. Okay, So uh, please take a note of this uh, operation Samudra Maitri. It is India's humanitarian assistance to tsunami hit Indonesia. Our next topic is Digi Yatra. This is an initiative by Ministry of Civil Aviation under which the flyers can soon use facial recognition technology to enter the airport. Here, this is a biometric enabled digital processing which enable travelers to enter the airport building by scanning a QR code on their mobile phones after undergoing facial recognition. Actually, this initiative seeks to promote paperless and hassle-free air travel. This is actually voluntary and if the travelers are interested, they would require to initially register themselves at a web portal by providing any identity proof including Aadhaar. Okay? So the web portal is scheduled to be ready by February 2019 and Hyderabad and Bangalore airports would be the first to implement the digital processing of passengers. There would be one time verification at the departure airport while traveling for the first time using the ID. So this is all about Digi Yatra. Our next topic is Udyam Abhilasha. Sidbi launched Udyam Abhilasha in 115 aspirational districts. We know that India is a country having more manpower got employed in the primary sector called agriculture sector, agriculture and allied sectors. Okay, So it is actually high time to liberate manpower from the agriculture sector. So or else we may refer uh, the employment, disguised unemployment is severe in India because more manpower is engaged in a task which, which doesn't require that, mu that much manpower. This is disguised unemployment. So, if we liberate manpower, we should employ them. Okay? We cannot employ them directly in the tertiary sector. So, we need to develop a shock, I mean, shock absorbing secondary sector or manufacturing sector or I mean, industrial sector. Okay? So, we need to uh, give incentives to people to get away or get rid of their agricultural occupation so that they can they can be employed in a, in a, in a secondary sector. So keeping, in, keeping a view on that, SIDBI launched a, an initiative called Udyam Abhilasha in 115 aspirational district. Udyam Abhilasha is a national level entrepreneurship awareness campaign. SIDBI will join to contribute to the transformation mission unleashed for the districts. The six day campaign would be running parallelly from 3rd October across India. So it has already started. It would create and strengthen cadre of more than 800 trainers to provide entrepreneurship training to the aspiring youths, encouraging them to enter the admit segment of entrepreneurs. Sydney has, Sydney has partnered with common service centers, e-governance services India Limited, a special purpose vehicle set up by Ministry of Electronics and IT for implementing the campaign. Okay, So this is all about Udyam Abhilasha. So let us move on to Sidbi. Sidbi is the principal financial institution for the promotion, financing and development of micro, small and medium enterprises sector or MSM. The purpose is to provide refinance. Okay, we'll explain what is the difference between refinance and finance. Refinance facilities and short term lending to industries. It was actually set up on April 2, 1990 through an act of parliament. It was incorporated initially as a wholly owned subsidiary of Industrial Development Bank of India or IDBI. Currently, the ownership is held by 34 government of India owned or controlled institutions. 
State Bank of India is the largest individual shareholder of SIDB with holding of 16.73% shares followed by Government of India and Life Insurance Corporation of India or LIC. SIDB operates under the Department of Financial Services, Government of India. SIDB is one of the four All India financial institutions regulated and supervised by RBI. And the other three are Exim Bank, Export Import Bank, NABAD and NHB. In order to increase and support money supply to the MSC sector, it operates a refinance program known as Institutional Finance Program. Under this program, SIDB extends term loan assistance to banks, small finance banks and non-banking financial companies. Besides refinance operation, SIDB also lends directly to MSMEs and it is headquartered in Lucknow. Okay, so this is all about SIDB. So when it comes to refinancing and financing, refinancing is not direct lending. Refinancing is lending via some other entities. Okay, for example, institutional finance program, which I have mentioned earlier. Okay, under institutional finance program, SIDB is not directly lending to MSMEs. Rather, SIDB extends term loan assist assistance to banks, small finance banks and non-banking financial companies. And these entities, non-banking financial companies, small finance banks, they will identify the required uh, parties and they will lend loans. Okay, this is refinancing. Okay, what is financing? Financing means if it is directly, if it is directly lending money to MSMEs, then that is financing. Okay, refinancing and financing. Besides refinance operations, SIDB also lends directly to MSMEs. It is headquartered in Lucknow. Okay, please keep all these factual informations. Please understand all these factual informations about SIDB. So let us move on to our regular programs. We can begin with MAP aided program, abbreviated as MAP. It's been four days since we have started discussing biosphere reserves under this MAP aided program, and that too listed under global network of biosphere reserves and so far we have covered three biosphere reserves starting from Nilgiris, Gulf of Manar and yesterday we have discussed Sundarbans and today we are discussing Nanda Devi biosphere reserve. Okay, So since this is a map aided program we have to first of all we have to locate where exactly this Nanda Devi biosphere reserve is. Okay, Nanda, Nanda Devi biosphere reserve is located in Uttarakhand one of the northernmost states of India and it is part of western Himalayas. Okay, And there are two protected areas inside Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. They are Nanda Devi National Park and Valley of Flowers National Park. They have a peculiarity and the peculiarity is that they together constitute a world heritage site for its natural values. Okay. Say they both of them constitute, both of them together constitute what? A World Heritage Site. Okay. And actually, it has been awarded with that status in 1988. Okay. You know who is actually giving the status of World Heritage, I mean World Heritage Site. It is UNESCO. Okay. So in 1988, these two protected areas, these two national parks were given the status of World Heritage Site for its natural values. And this is the general map of this is the general map of uh, Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. Okay, this whole area comprises Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. By now, you, you are actually familiar with uh, the conservation called uh, Biosphere Reserve and the concept of man and biosphere and why biosphere reserves are often regarded as the best method of conservation because it is actually taking into consideration man, men or man also an integral part of conservation. So they are divided into three zones. Or oh, you are actually familiar, you are actually acquainted with all these concepts, okay. So you might have, you might have come across uh, those three zones, uh, core zone, buffer zone, trans transition zone, etc. And you can see from this map, these two national parks, Valley of Flowers National Park and Nanda Devi National Park, they are well within the core area of this biosphere reserve, okay. So let us have some quick facts about Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve and uh, one of the major attraction of Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve is 
Mount Nanda Devi. Okay, Mount Nanda Devi is the second largest, second largest peak in India. You know the first one. The largest peak in India is Peak Kanchenjunga, and uh, it it is 8,586 meter tall. And another attraction of this Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve is that a river, Rishi Ganga, is actually flowing through the Nanda Devi National Park. And uh, if we move on, uh, the major species protected in this Biosphere Reserve are snow leopard, Himalayan musk deer, blue sheep, or which is also known as baral, and goral. Okay, these are the four species protected under Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserves. And in 2004, uh, UNESCO has escalated uh, Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve into the World Network of uh, Biosphere Reserves. So in 2004, uh, our Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve entered into the World Network of Biosphere Reserve. Okay, that comprises uh, Nanda Devi Biosphere Reserve. Uh, let us move on to our next regular session, which is uh, PQRS. Today, under PQRS, previous question revision series, we are discussing a question that have been asked from science and technology that has been asked from science and technology in 2014. So, read the question. It's about spacecrafts and its functions. Okay, it's a match the following type question and you have to select the correct answer. Okay, so one of the pairs is wrongly matched. Let me tell you, this is one of the classical examples, okay, where you can apply the elimination technique, okay. So what is actually good about objective questions? Objective questions are actually printed with answers. They are actually coming with correct answers, okay. Objective, the, the positive thing about objective question error question is that it is printed with correct answers, right. So all you have to do is that you have to apply your logic. You have to rely on your, on your conceptual knowledge, your factual knowledge and arrive at the correct answer, okay. So this, this sort of questions uh, will uh, reveal the genuinity or the kind of, I mean, uh, the genuineness of UPSC examination, okay. UPSC examination, in UPSC examination, your concepts, your, I mean, kind of, uh, I, won't, I won't say this is a trick. This is not a trick, rather you are actually uh, applying your logic and arriving at answer, okay. So let us check. So against Cassini Hygens, it is mentioned Cassini Hygens spacecraft is orbiting the Venus and transmitting data to the Earth. And the second spacecraft in question is Messenger. Against the Messenger, it is mentioned that mapping and investigating the Mercury. And the third option is Voyager 1 and 2. Third choice, third option, not third choice, third option is Voyager 1 and 2. Its function is given as exploring the outer solar system, okay. So let us check one by one. So this is all about Cassini Hygens, okay. If you make a mere survey into Cassini Hygens, you can arrive at the answer. What is it mentioned over there? Cassini Hygens is an unmanned spacecraft sent to planet Saturn. What is given over here? Cass against Cassini Hygens, it is said orbiting the Venus and transmitting data to the Earth, okay. So it is a it is a wrong statement. So by knowing statement 1 is wrong, look at the options. If you eliminate options containing, options containing, I mean statement 1, only one option prevails. So if, if option 1 is wrong, you have, you, you have, you can eliminate option A, option C and option D. Then automatically our answer becomes option B, 2 and 3. So the rest of the statements are correct. But since this being a multi-statement question, we will check the validity of other statements or validity of other spacecrafts and its functions. But we have already arrived at the answer, okay. This is how elimination work out. This is how elimination works out, okay. So please practice, please calibrate yourself. So Cassini Hygens, uh, let us drill into the details. Cassini Hygens is an unmanned spacecraft sent to planet Saturn. It's actually a joint endeavor of NASA. ESA, European Space Agency and Italian Space Agency. It is actually the fourth attempt. It is actually the fourth attempt to explore Saturn, but it is the first successful attempt. So that is the speciality of Cassini. Cassini is the fourth space probe to visit Saturn and the first to enter successfully in its orbit, okay. That is the peculiarity of 
Cassini Huygens. Then uh, the name Cassini Huygens actually it is uh, attributed to two scientists. Okay, it is mentioned in the I mean in, it is mentioned in the material. You can refer to that. The Cassini part is the orbiter and the lander part is Huygens. Huygens. Okay, keep in mind. On December 25, 2004, Huygens landed. Huygens lander had separated from orbiter and landed on Saturn's moon, Titan. So the moon of Titan. So the moon of Saturn is Titan. On 14 January 2005, this was the first landing ever accomplished in the outer solar system. Okay. So again, this is a record. So that comprises Cassini Huygens. Let us move on to the other options. Messenger. Messenger is a NASA robotic spacecraft that orbited planet Mercury. To study Mercury's chemical composition, geology and magnetic field. These are all factual information. So, okay, it is mentioned in the, I mean, our uh, material. Okay, you can refer to that. It is the first spacecraft which managed to enter the orbit of Mercury. Okay, again, it, it also holds a record. What, what, what record? It is the first spacecraft to enter the orbit of Mercury. Then Voyager 1 and 2, they are both part of Voyager program to study the outer solar system. Okay, So, whenever you come across the term Voyager or Voyager 1 and 2 Voyager program, it is about the study of outer solar system. Voyager 1, it is the first man, it, the record, record hold, held by uh, Voyager 1. First man-made object to cross the solar system and enter into the interstellar space. Okay, Keep in mind. Launched by NASA in 1977. Okay, It, it was launched in 1977, but it reached the I mean, it, it, it crossed the solar system in 2012 only. See the long journey. And then when it comes to Voyager 2, it is it is the identical twin of Voyager 1. It again hold a record. It, it was actually launched 16 days prior to Voyager 1, Voyager 2, I mean Voyager 1. And it is the only spacecraft to have visited either of the ice giants. See, these two planets are referred to as ice giants, okay, because they are farther from the sun, Uranus and Neptune. So, this is the spacecraft which which reached or which visited these two ice giants Uranus and Neptune. Okay, So, uh, by now we are actually winding up today's session. Hope you have uh, enjoyed this uh, uh, short session and uh, do subscribe our channel and hit the bell icon so that you will be notified with uh, when and once we upload new videos. Okay, Thank you. Good night.